So hello everyone. I'm uh, Elzbieta Feller Pitu, the assistant director of the Chabraya Center for Historical Studies. Uh, our director, Jonathan Glassman, unfortunately couldn't be here today. So I have the enormous pleasure of uh, greeting all of you and uh, welcoming you to this event. This is part of a, of a series of Zoom meetings and Zoom webinars that take the place of our normal annual lunch lecture. So unfortunately we cannot feed you uh, in uh, actuality, but we can feed you with uh, uh, intellectually. Uh, the, uh, our distinguished guest today is James Millward of Georgetown University, a historian of China, and tomorrow we will hear him again uh, in a webinar, not a web meeting, on the crisis in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. We are also looking forward to our annual collaboration with the Holocaust Education Foundation of Northwestern. That is an annual lecture. This uh, webinar will take place on November 19th um, when Erin McLaughlin of Washington University, St. Louis will speak about Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and the film's outtakes. So it's an interesting project where she looks at what was not included in the film and what that tells us. Center events this year are being recorded and they can be seen on the center website at historicalstudies.northwestern.edu. This year also Chabria Center events are included in a series um, organized by the history department and called Historians at Home, since we're all working from home. And these include roundtables and panels on such important topics that are now in the news and that are much on our minds as pandemics and policing. Um, details of these can be found on the History Department website. Today, Professor Millward will be joined in conversation by two Northwestern historians of Southeast Asia, Melissa McCauley and Hayden Cherry. Professor Cherry's field is the history of modern Vietnam his book, Down and Out in Saigon, Stories of the Poor in the Colonial City, 1900 to 1940, was published last year by Yale University Press. Professor Macaulay specializes in late imperial and modern Chinese history. She is the author of Social Power and Legal Culture, Litigation Masters in Late Imperial China. And at present, she's completing a book on the port polities of the South China Sea from the 17th century to 1927. Professor Macaulay will now introduce our guest speaker. Melissa. Great, thanks Elspeth. And before I introduce everyone, the format we're uh, following is uh, Jim will speak for 10 or 15 minutes, presuming that most people have read the circulated paper, or at least have faked it. Then I'll offer a few comments for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then Hayden will follow, um, will follow uh, that, follow me with about 10 or 15 minutes worth of commentary, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So it's kind of different from our normal Shabraya approach where the speaker speaks while we eat our lunch in peace. Anyway, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce an old friend to the Shabraya Center. Um, James Millward is a professor of history in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and one of the world's leading authorities on the history and politics of China's relationship with Central Asia. Um, he's a pioneering scholar in what is called the New Qing history. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Qing was the last dynasty of China, uh, which was founded by Manchus who um, conquered China from the Northeast in 1644 and then were overthrown in 1912. So that's the framework of time we're discussing here mostly. We're mostly talking about the 20th century. But anyway, uh, relying on the um, opening of the Chinese archives to uh, foreigners, uh, new Qing historians like Jim demonstrated that China was simply a part of a much larger dominion that extended deeply into Central Asia. And that uh, Qing governing practices drew as much upon um, inner Asian traditions as they did on Chinese ones. Um, also, the Qing had not sinicized themselves or Chinified themselves, so to speak, uh, as much as we had been led to believe. Um, they, the Qing, the Manchus presented a 
Chinese face to the Chinese and a Central Asian face uh, to the Tibetans, Mongols, and um, others. And this was one key to their success as a dynasty. Uh, Melward in particular revealed the multifaceted nature of Qing governance in Central Asia, starting with his path-breaking first book, Beyond the Pass, Economy, Ethnicity, and Empire in Qing uh, Central Asia, 1759 to 1864, which was published by Stanford University Press in 1998. And the book focused on the many challenges the Qing confronted in governing Xinjiang, and this enormous region that the Qing ended up conquering in the middle of the 18th century. Um, but combined with his second single authored monograph, uh, Eurasian Co Crossroads, a history of Xinjiang, uh, he, he has firmly established himself as the leading historian uh, of Xinjiang, this region, uh, writing in any language. Um, so we're very fortunate that his two talks this week deal primarily with the ongoing fraught relationship between the Chinese and the people who live in this area that was later in the 20th century formally incorporated into the modern Chinese state. Um, there's another side uh, to the famous James Millward, uh, however, for he is an accomplished musician and scholar uh, of musical traditions. He is currently working on his labor of love titled Lutes on the Silk Road, what, uh, what the journey of a musical instrument tells us about cultural exchange across Eurasia from ancient to modern times. And he plays several uh, musical instruments, uh, including, as you can see behind him, uh, including uh, the mandolin. And he's a, a member of a, a, of a bluegrass band called By and By. Together they've um, published, or, you know, uh, published, cut uh, a few albums and they regularly play throughout the DC region and uh, they have been inv invited to perform at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Anyway, uh, please welcome uh, Jim Millward. And Jim, you have 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Melissa, for the uh, uh, e extravagantly <laughs> exaggerated introduction. Um, I, like, I like the adjective pathbreaking. Uh, even if it isn't, isn't quite correct. Um, so, all right, so I'm gonna quickly talk about, and I'll, and I'll share my screen uh, in a moment, um, just sort of a couple of the main ideas I made in the paper, for those of you who might not have had a chance to look at it in, in, in detail. Um, a little bit in the background of just this whole enterprise, I was asked a couple of years ago, I guess, a year and a half ago, to do a book review of a big fat, new textbook of modern Chinese history um, that Harvard Press had, uh, came out with. And actually London Review of Books asked me to do it. And I was all excited, you know. Um, and of course it took me a lot longer to do than it should have, mainly because I had to read a 700 page textbook, which I never really did even when I was an undergraduate and was supposed to be reading the whole textbook. So, it, you know, I had to plow through it. But in the course of doing that, I really um, found lots to, to, to complain about, frankly, but not specifically the author's own fault, but much more just paradigmatic things in the field. And so I, I put a lot of that into the review, which I put up on Medium recently and tweeted about, and th that's caused some conversation. Uh, and then I sat down to kind of write an article version that goes more into those, those things, those, those themes, those questions that I had put in the in the, in the review without picking just on this one author. Um, and so what you see is, is that, and so maybe a first or a second draft of that. The first draft I actually wrote um, in Madrid. I, I, was, I teach a short course in Granada uh, every year during my spring break. And I go someplace else, you know, to see some other part of Spain. And this year I had to write this paper for yet another event and so rather than running around and going anywhere in Madrid, and this was, by the way, in March 2020, um, I sat in my hotel room and wrote this paper. So this paper probably kept me from getting COVID um, <laughs> because I left the day after I left Spain, it shut down. And, you know, I came back. Anyway, that's another, another whole story. But so let me just uh, to quickly kind of go through some of those ideas. Um, I'm going to share this. 
All right. Um, Okay, now you should be seeing the PowerPoint, is that correct? Yeah, and then I wanna actually bring up my own notes. I just wanna make, see. So are you still seeing just the PowerPoint or are you seeing, Melissa, can you? Yeah, j just the, I'm just, just seeing the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay, yes. so I've got my, other, good, okay. So that's good to know. Um, okay, so uh, some of these things, as I mentioned in the, in the paper, I was inspired to, start to think about some of these issues by an exchange in chalk in the, to the square at Georgetown. And as you see, uh, you know, somebody, during the time of the Hong Kong protests, someone had written stop police brutality, stop political arrests. And then someone responded to that, Hong Kong belongs uh, to, to China. And there were some other you know, conversations uh, in there as, as well, which I don't sort of go into. But I was struck by that um, that answer because it's really exactly the same thing that the People's Republic of China and the, the CCP does every time there's mass criticisms about human rights issues in Tibet or in, in, in Xinjiang um, as well, is they come out with another white paper, this one, and there's been a couple recently since things have been going on in Xinjiang, but you know, this one's about cultural protection in response to accusations that their policies are trying to expunge Uyghur culture. Um, and as you can see, you know, it begins with Xinjiang ethnic cultures are part of Chinese culture, right? It begins with that, that assertion. Um, and indeed, the, you know, the very first paragraphs um, do this. And then they go back to the pre-Qin period. So the earliest imperial dynasty uh, in China is where they begin. And this happens all the time, right? I mean, this is sort of the standard thing that, you know, all of these places have been part of China since ancient times. Um, and we're very, very, you know, used to that. Uh, used to that assertion. Um, but there are some problems with it, um, really quite obvious ones. And, you know, the first one is that when, by, by calling on China uh, or, on, you know, by, by calling out human rights abuses and police brutality and so on, no one is actually challenging the sovereignty of PRC. And indeed, the Hong Kong demonstrators, I mean, there were some, but for the most part, they avoided challenging PRC sovereignty, and yet they were accused of being separatists. So this kind of assertion of sovereignty or ownership reveals insecurity, right? You know, it's not really on the table. That's not the question. Um, you know, secondly, just because you are in sovereign control over a piece of territory doesn't mean you have a right to abuse them. Right. And this is, you know, my, my wife beater analogy, you know, if someone tells you to stop beating your wife, if your response is, she's my wife, I'll beat her if I want. Um, that's essentially what the PRC is saying when they, when they say this, right, this is my, my territory, so stay out of it. But the main issue is uh, that the, the, this non sequitur uh, of, of mentioning, you know, ancient historical uh, possession as a response to complaints about human rights, uh, you know, it, it depends on a particular way of looking at, at Chinese, Chinese history. Sorry. Um, right, because um, we tend, there, there are, you know, nationalistic uh, approaches to history, obviously anywhere, and, and nationalistic, um, Elisions and, 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 and so on. But I think it's particularly the case when we talk about China um, that we, uh, we see China as kind of timeless, as a, at a, as a metaphysical entity. Um, it, you know, it's, it's unconstrained either by space or by time. We see it as occupying all of the PRC's current territory, even when it didn't in the past. We see it as continuing uh, even when, in fact, the various states that we now call China uh, were in di different smaller parts of, of the territory, uh, or they were run by people who weren't Chinese, um, or they were competing with each other, you know, locked in bloody struggles to, to wipe the, each other out. Nonetheless, they're all China, right? So there's obviously some logical um, problems with this. Uh, and of course, the most extreme version of this is that all the territory that is was part of the Qing dynasty, the Qing empire, or part of the PRC today has always been Chinese one way or another. And that's the official way in which the, P the PRC talks about 
Chinese history. Xinjiang. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, tentang apa? Okay, so someone needs to mute unless there's a question. Sejarah Xinjiang. Ini dia mulai sama apa? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I bring up a couple of conceptual and uh, theoretical issues that we that that are problematic, and I won't. Sorry, I'm scrolling wildly through my list here. Um, I don't want to go through you know, too much detail on this. Uh, one of them is the idea of the tributary system connected to the idea of what's known as Tian Sha or all under heaven, uh, which is in turn, also, term, in turn also connected to the idea of you know, sinicization, as, as Professor Macaulay mentioned before, this kind of spontaneous acculturation. Um, and I've critiqued various aspects of this. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, the idea of the tribute system is, is an assertion that in the past, Chinese states were at the center of a hierarchically arranged uh, system that worked differently from the way international relations works uh, in, in other places in the world. Uh, and that everyone was pretty much happy to be satellites around this, this Confucian uh, cynic center. Uh, that all trade required a, a kind of diplomatic homage, which involved paying gifts, which, was, which we call tribute. Um, and that, and that, that the Chinese ambit, the Chinese orbit expanded, not through military conquest, but through the sort of attraction of, of virtue. And ultimately, you know, non-Chinese people came over and became Chinese people spontaneously through this process known as, um, known as sinicization. All right, so there's a lot of problems with this empirically, theoretically, uh, in terms of translation of terms like tribute and so on, and, and I can go into more of those details. It's been much critiqued over the last 20, 30 years even. Um, but one of the main issues is that, and, and, and this gets picked up again now when, when pundits talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and, and future models of a risen China in the world. Um, mainly the problem is that, that when we talk about this, we're confusing what was a world view of cynic thinkers with a real world order that was something that empirically uh, existed. And this gives a false notion of what's sometimes called um, Con Confucian peace, uh, that there was never really any wars in China. Um, if there were any, there were only civil, civil wars or, or involving China and its, uh, and, and its neighbors. Um, and that issue is, is very clear. And here's this one sentence from this, from this textbook. That I, that I plucked out, this 19, 2019 textbook. The Hai Qing period was a time of peace and social order, material splendor, cultural refinement, technological progress, and continued territorial expansion. Uh, so what's the issue here? Well, how can it be both one of territorial expansion and one of peace, uh, right? It, it, it can't be. There, there was a military dimension to that territorial expansion very clearly. Um, another issue with the with the tributary system, and this map, I apologize, isn't terribly clear, but I put it in the article, um, you know, is that states that were engaged, that were, that were written up in Chinese internal uh, you know, government propaganda or government um, histories and so on as, as presenting tribute, uh, when we oversimplify this idea of tributary system, uh, they very easily get seen as vassals, as, as really subservient, as really uh, controlled by some center in China. And again, it's not clear enough in this, but um, the map key suggests that all these places with their names written in capitals like this were all vassals of China um, up until certain points in the, 18th, in the 19th and 20th century. So, and this again, in 2019, we're still getting maps like this in textbooks that people are going to read saying that Kazakhstan was a Chinese vassal, Korea was a Chinese vassal, Burma was a Chinese vassal, you know. And uh, there was that famous chocolate cake meeting between Trump and Xi Jinping in Mar-a-Lago when they had a really tremendous piece of chocolate cake. And, you know, um, Secretary Xi told Trump something about Korea that he didn't know before. This is, Trump told us is coming out. So I think what that conversation consisted of was perhaps something along these lines about you know, a, a Sinocentric notion of, of Korea's status in the past. Um, 
All right, so I, I won't talk any more about the tributary system, sinicization, uh, Tian Xia kind of complex. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about a second big uh, sort of stalking horse of mine, bugbear of mine. And that's the idea of the dynasties. Now, when we talk about you know, other places, and those of you who are Europeanists and others, maybe you can challenge me on this a little bit, but um, you know, we talk about different kingdoms, different monarchies. You know, they, they come and go. Um, yes, there are rulers who are, who are dynasties, as you know, you're um, one family or another. Um, but when we use the word dynasty in regard to China, it's very, very different. We actually use the word dynasty to mean a state itself. Uh, but the implication is that that state kind of stays there and, uh, you know, China is, is, is endless, is timeless, and then dynasties cycle in and out. Um, instead, rather than thinking about all of just the different states and different places of different peoples and so on. And um, if I do have time, Melissa, I'd like to um, play this video. Uh, it's, it's worth a minute. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, actually, you know what I'm going to have to do? Hang on. I'm going to have to uh, switch my screen, I think, to make it work. So let me just do that. Sorry, I need to. Share sound. Okay. You all seeing this? Okay, so uh, anyway, I think that, so that's um, Peter Bowl and um, what's Kirby's first name? Um, Bill. Bill Kirby, right, of course. So, <laughs> so um, you know, as I say, you know, good for them and it's, it's fun and it is quite very, it's useful. Uh, the issue with that approach, and again, they didn't invent it, um, but the issue with this approach is that this is the standard list of dynasties, um, but it skips several hundred period, several hundred years, for example, between the Han uh, and the Sui, uh, and it, uh, and also uh, chaotic periods after the Song. Uh, it skips um, dynasties that were not run by Han, such as the Kitan Liao and the Jurchen Jin. It does have the Yuan, which are the Mongols in there. Uh, but it really is a, um, a Han-centric uh, uh, listing uh, that those emissions are not politically neutral. They're not ethnically neutral. They're really telling a particular kind of story. Um, all right, so conscious of the time, let's see. So I won't go through all this, but I, I, I looked up, you know, in the, in the OED, um, and, and the interesting thing that comes out of this is the word dynasty is that um, it's used in a couple of senses. One, for a sovereignty or a power or a regime, which is how we use it when we talk about China. And then, of course, it's the other sense of the succession of rulers, so the family line, um, right? And both of them, at least according to the, to the OED, which tends to give, if not the earliest, they try and give early representative attestations of terms. It's applied to Thebes, it's applied to Assyrians, Trojans, Italians, um, and, and so on. Italian is kind of interesting in that list as well. But um, there's definitely an Oriental uh, sense to this, right? They're applied to these kinds of you know, other uh, distant states, uh, Oriental Oriental states or dynasties. They're not you know, kingdoms and monarchies like us. Uh, and then I love these engram things. I'm not quite sure really how, you know, how far to, to go with them, how far to trust them. But you know, what this is, is a going through all the books that Google has scanned, uh, they give you percentage appearance, percentage occurrences of certain terms. Uh, and so we see here that this is an 18th century term, it really begins to pick up. I don't know, I haven't looked up what these spikes are in the 16th century. That would be kind of interesting. But um, in any case, we see when it comes up. And, and I also look for, you can look in for what those books are. Uh, and they really cluster around discussions of China, uh, initially from a uh, Jesuit informed, very influential history 
of China written by uh, French author Du Aude. Uh, and so I'm, I'm suggesting that you know, this word dynasty is really um, like other words like barbarian, uh, like the word China itself uh, has actually grown up as part of a kind of global conversation about China's past. Uh, this is the, the scholar Lydia Liu refers to this as a super sign, something determined discursively um, in, 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 in a multilingual environment, a translingual environment. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, uh, the ways in which our use of the term dynasty and the dynastic cycle kind of feed into a particular Chinese version of, um, of its own history and historical lineage um, you know, is not an accident. It's actually part of the development of the term. And likewise, uh, the modern nationalistic use of that lineage, that notion of the dynastic cycle um, for, for nationalistic purposes, um, is in turn related to the fact that this English and French and you know, Western term dynasty exists with its slightly different meaning from Chinese equivalents. I can go into more of that. In any case, I also look at other words we use and, and, and ways in which we tend to occlude the military and imperialistic aspects of Chinese expansion, particularly that of the Qing and, and, and 20th century. And I have a series of suggestions for how we really we should talk about, um, about China, uh, avoiding the bias towards you know, monolithic centralizing expansionist moments. In other words, we tend to gravitate towards you know, the big imperial moments, the ones where the, the footprint on the map is, is, is big and glorious. We leave out more complex periods um, because they're not unified, but why should we? We also tend to leave out the, those that are not quote unquote Chinese, but for which the ruling dynasts were uh, other, other groups. That, that's not entirely the case, but often that is the case. I, I wanna get rid of the idea of the tribute system. Uh, I think we should use China as a geographical term, more like we use the word Europe, um, mainly geographical. Obviously, there's cultural meaning in that sense as well. Uh, I think we should use dynasty to mean the family line. So the Isengyoro dynasty ruled the Qing Empire. The Li dynasty ruled the Tang Empire. And we should call China-based states what they call themselves. So Qin, Han, Qing, Ming, uh, you know, Nanjiao, Xi, Shisha, well, some of those states we only have Chinese names for, not native names, but using those terms, um, I think that's actually more, more accurate, in fact, and avoid the, the catch-all use of China. Absolutely, there's cultural or civilizational continuity in China, linking up um, the, the, the lineage of dynasties, but also other states. Um, and a broad spatial influence of, of what we could call Chinese civilization, or perhaps uh, you know, Han civilization. Um, I think we should refer to this as the syndicate by analogy to the word the Islamicate uh, or perhaps you know, Christendom or something like that. And that would include for some purposes Vietnam, Korea, uh, even Japan, maybe some other other states. But it's not a political uh, term. It's a, it's a cultural ecumen. Uh, we could do a lot better stressing the diversity of China rather than uh, you know, linear, homogeneous uh, political unity, which is what the, the modern Chinese national narrative uh, doubles down on. Uh, but the multiplicity and the diversity, I think, are actually are great strengths. And although I get, you know, pilloried on Twitter and elsewhere for, for saying this kind of thing, that I want to balkanize China or destroy China or whatever, you know, in fact, if I were running PRC PR, I'd be all about embracing diversity rather than the opposite. They, they get a lot of mileage out of that if they just did it right. Um, and, and call colonialism, colonialism where we see it. Let's look at it. Let's look at it comparatively. Let's think about impacts on environment, on ethnic groups, uh, just as we, we do or should do more forcefully in US history and in other places um, as, as well. All right, let me stop sharing. And sorry, that was a very rushed and not very sort of complete approach to the paper, but um, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there and we can talk about other things. Yeah, I'm 
thinking, rethinking this model for the Shipwright Center, because it's really hard to get an entire paper. We probably should have given you more time. And us less no, it's time. a common model. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm just, I'm just lazy about summarizing. No, let's, let's, let's blame it on COVID um, or, or Trump. <laughs> anyway, I want to leave uh, time for discussion because I think your paper raises all sorts of really interesting comparative questions about colonialism, uh, the simultaneous disintegration of these multi-ethnic empires, because of course the Qing was not alone, um, the entire question of indigeneity and um, its relationship to expanding frontiers and so on. And I, I just think it's a really thought provoking paper. I'm going to address the paper more because that's how I prepared. Um, and I agree with a lot of it, but I'm going to push back on it a little just to um, make things interesting. Hence my extravagant introduction. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but I'd like to make three, three points. Um, um, the first one's going to be a little longer, the other's short. The first point I'd like to ad address is a term, because you talk about terminology quite a bit in the paper, but a term that does not show up in your paper, and that is nationalism. Um, for one thing, I, Xi Jinping is not so novel, I don't think at all. Um, there has been no transition, I don't think, to racial vocabulary under his leadership. He's merely picking up on a, a kind of a status, quasi-colonial impulse um, that goes all the way back to Liang Qichao, who was a um, major intellectual reformer at the turn of the 20th century. Um, he, he revealed himself to be something of a bloodline celebrating Han Chauvinist in his very famous 1904 work, The Eight Grandees of Chinese Colonialism. Of course, in the early 20th century, Chinese nationalists were all using the term colonialism proudly. I mean, it only became politically incorrect later. But uh, Liang Qichao basically espoused what we would consider to be a form of Chinese colonialism. He uh, declared that the majority of the people of Southeast Asia descended directly from the Chinese Yellow Emperor, which is to say um, founding father of the Chinese race, so to speak. Um, but he's a mythical sage king. Um, and therefore, and this, is, this is his term, therefore, whether from the standpoint of geoscience, Dishir, or of history, it really is only natural that these lands serve as the colonial territories of our race, race, Mu'zu. So for him, it was scientifically and historically, biologically obvious to him that China should be ruling over these, uh, the indigenous people of Southeast Asia. He was speaking specifically of Southeast Asia in this case. Um, but the historian Xiu, uh, Xiumi, uh, Xiumin Tsai has depicted this sort of thinking in early 20th century Chinese intellectual circles as a Sinocentric form of colonialism in which Chinese expansion into these regions, Central Asia and Southeast Asia was a natural, was natural and pre, uh, predicated on the largely peaceful infiltration of culturally similar Chinese. Um, so this isn't anachronistic. I mean, the Chinese were using col uh, colonialism themselves. And the, the first great his Chinese historian of Chinese colonialism, Li Changfu, wrote a history of Chinese colonialism in 1936. He called it Chinese colonialism. And he saw the geographical expansion of Chinese into Central Asia and Southeast Asia as a natural and inevitable expansion of Chinese territory that was only interrupted by the rise of Western uh, imperialism, which was backed by the power of industrial capitalism. And Chiang Kai-shek you know, uh, is basically arriving very late in this game. The state builders themselves arrived very late in this game of using this kind of biological bloodline um, discourse. And, and scholars in the West have not been oblivious to this kind of domestication of the foreign territories of China and the um, overseas Chinese um, uh, as well. Um, scholars like Sai or Pesenjit Dwora, Jingzu, Shelley Chan um, have considered the kind of transnational dimensions of early 20th century Chinese nationalism and its connection to nation state building. Uh, Shelley Chan is, I think, particularly interest in this, interesting in this because she's talking about a diaspora moment of Chinese uh, national formation when scholars affiliated with Jinan University in Shanghai sought to link Chinese national identity to Chinese emigrants going in all sorts of directions. And these specialists, particularly in South China Sea Studies, portrayed overseas Chinese as incomplete colonialists without 
China's protection and geopolitical incorporation. I mean, this is what they were teaching in Chinese, in this particular Chinese university was quite common in the 19-teens and 1920s and 30s. Um, uh, true colonialism could only be achieved by the Chinese after their incorporation by the Chinese state. Uh, and Chan's work is interesting, I think, because she, um, she discerned this nationalist tendency in the 20s and 30s uh, to use the intensified Chinese migration of this period, because China was so chaotic and everything, as a form of imperialist competition with the British, French, uh, Americans, and particularly the Japanese. Um, uh, there was this idea you just migrate the heck out of these places, and uh, that would be the way you compete with the foreigners um, and take over their territories, literally demographically, or you know, biologically, or physically. Anyway, so Chinese nationalism in the early 20th century and today is, is what I think is driving a lot of this project of domesticating the other you see in Xi Jinping. So my question, you know, along this question of nationalism is, how would you factor the history of Chinese nationalism into your critique? Um, and that leads me to the second point about Chinese dynasties and the way the dynastic approach reinforces PRC claims to colonial domination, as you call it, over the Central Asian conquest of the Qing. And I actually agree with a lot of your critique of the dynasty, so I mean, I'm not disagreeing with it per se. I think it's, well, anyway, I'll just stay on topic here. But this thing that you critique in the paper, Zhang Tong or Dao Tong, the orthodox line of transmission, which was promoted in Chinese historiography, in which one dynasty gives way to the next dynasty. Um, and of course, the PRC is buying into it. Um, that was mostly an approach to gain political legitimation in pre-modern China. I mean, it really wasn't, I mean, traditionally, in general, it wasn't a way, it was, it was rare that a Chinese dynasty would actually seek to recapture the entire territory of its predecessors, and very few did, in fact. And in fact, the concern, um, the, their concern in, in using this orthodox line of transmission was simply to legitimate itself, precisely because so many of them were not Han or Chinese Chinese. Um, and if anything, the old classical scholars, Meng Din complained about wasteful, the wasteful extravagance of warfare and um, territorial aggrandizement. Um, Beyond that, um, is the dynastic concept in your term, in the paper at least, an ideological weapon deployed for di displacement and ethnocide? End of quote. Well, if you were a Zungar Mongol in the middle of the 18th century, you probably agree because that's exactly what happened. Um, but it seemed to me in general, the dynastic mode based on the classical tradition actually tolerated religious and ethnic diversity in general. I mean, obviously there are exceptions to this. It's the modern anti-dynastic mode that incorporate, that would set itself to incorporating the 56 ethnic uh, minorities into the Chinese state. Um, and, you know, one could argue that the, the dynast, the classical tradition um, that theoretically under, undergirded the dynasties, including the Qing, uh, was more religiously and ethnically tolerant than the Re Republic of China, than the PRC, and certainly any European government of its day. Um, so is the problem really the dynastic paradigm, as you point out, or is it modern nationalism that anachronistically hardens the waxing and waning of these various imperial states, whatever, um, and their borders into, into a kind of timeless permanence? Um, now, of course, your point is not I don't think it necessarily is the old dynastic paradigm. It's really this modern nationalism, um, the concept of China that has some sort of static historical reality across time and space. Um, I could say more about that, but I'll just make, make briefly my last point uh, about the reigning paradigm, what really drives historians. And obviously I'm not including Klaus Mülhan in this. I, I haven't read this text myself, but I've saved myself, it seems to me, a day of reading. But um, it is, is the dynastic paradigm, the reigning paradigm in Chinese studies? Has it been so for last several decades? Um, I, I think, in fact, it, it has not been. In fact, it has been the paradigm advanced by your old professor at Stanford, G. William Skinner, um, who's one of the two adjectives in the field. The other one's Fairbankian, as you've noted, but the other's Skinnerian, right? Skinnerian analysis. Um, uh, defied the spatial decrees. Levinsonian, your old um, 
by me. Levinsonian is the other, is a third. Oh, I know. We're, we're bowing to each other's uh, academic tradition or university. There. Yes, Berkeley. Uh, well, that's another story altogether. Um, anyway, so yes, there's three. Uh, but Skinnerian analysis de denied, defied the spatial decrees of the dynastic state. Uh, it configured China according to the economic and cultural geography of the natural terrain rather than the kind of administrative categories of the imperial state. And Skinner taught us to reject what you call these unified large polities, which is Absolutely, I think a correct way to study Chinese history. But he also taught us to think of Chinese space in the lived geography of the economy and the uh, dialect culture. Um, anyway, I could go on and on, but I'm gonna end here, but I'll end with two devil's advocates questions. Um, you start the paper by criticizing Chinese non sequiturs. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right on them too, including the fact that they tend to respond to criticisms of their human rights abuses by claiming that foreigners are trying to balkanize China. Um, uh, but isn't this paper in fact kind of reinforce, reinforcing this idea that the modern Chinese nation state doesn't have a historical claim to Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan? Um, and not that I'm disagreeing with you here, but aren't the Chinese right to fear this kind of sort of analysis that you're suggesting? Um, I, I just That's a question I'm throwing out there. The second devil's advocate question I would throw out, Jim, is um, related to that. Um, and that's, you know, um, and I don't mean this personally or that, but why should a Chinese person listen to what an American has to say about their uh, frontier policy, or if you prefer their uh, settler colonial policy, the uh, American record on their own frontier, their own Xinjiang province, so to speak, is so much worse. I mean, if you kind of objectively speaking, aside from the Zungar Mongols. Um, so why do people like Millward spend so much time criticizing China rather than their own abusive nation? Um, haven't you heard of the Chinese sailing, saying that he who snores the loudest falls asleep first? Anyway, I will leave it at that and open the floor up to Hayden. You'll have a chance to respond to um, all of this, obviously. But Hayden Cherry, my colleague in Southeast Asian history. Thanks. Um, so I first confronted the work of Professor Millward on the 15th of March 2007. What can you tell me about the blood sweating horses of Vergana? Jonathan Spence asked. This was my invitation during my qualifying examinations in modern Chinese history to talk about Professor Millward's pioneering book beyond the pass. I don't remember what my response was, uh, but it was, I think, more satisfactory than my response to Jonathan's next question. Why was tungsten important in modern Chinese history? This, a question about William Kirby's book, German and Re Germany and Republic in China, which my response elicited a frown. So I'm very happy today then to confront Professor Millwood's work in a forum other than a qualifying examination. And so my brief response to his very stimulating paper, China as Polylith, I will do three things. First, summarize the main claims in the paper. Second, consider the angle of historiographical critique the paper advances. And finally, conclude by sketching very crudely what I've come to think of as the cynic imaginary. But before I do this, I want to bracket certain questions that I do not intend to take up. In particular, I will avoid any discussion of contemporary political concerns about Chinese irredentism and state violence. I do this mainly because I share Professor Millwood's views on these issues. Indeed, it is through his scholarship and writing and tireless advocacy that my own views have been largely formed. So in my summary, I'm going to quote from Professor Millwood's paper extensively. He is concerned with a scholarly paradigm, he writes, that treats China as a metaphysical entity, unconstrained by space and time. It is seen as occupying places, even at times when it didn't, as continuing to always be China, when the avatars of China, the dynasties, were competing states locked in bloody struggles to replace each other. Professor Millwood goes on, in the most extreme version of this paradigm, it promoted, promoted by the official PRC narrative, this timeless China has forever occupied the territory 
comprised by the maximal extent of the Qing Empire and PRC today. This paradigm Professor Millwood declares is a patently false assertion of political continuity and ontological unity across time and space. It has been used to justify untold cruelty. Professor Millwood wants us therefore to rethink both the concepts and terminology we habitually use. And he then spends some time examining uh, these concepts, particularly the tribute system, Tianxia, all into heaven, and sinicization, which he associates with the work of John King Fairbank and those around him. He gives patient and careful attention to the role of dynasties in organizing the historiography of modern China. Our historiography is strongly biased towards the monolithic, the centralizing, the expansionist, and the imperial moments in the Chinese past. It denigrates or displaces non-Chinese peoples, be they pastoral nomads, forest and hill people, merchant networks from Western oases, or anyone speaking one of the many non-Semic languages that are also indigenous to geographical China and continental East Asia. The dynasty scheme perpetuates an accurate notion of a timeless China as imperial, monolithic, and ethnically hard, when in fact we know it wasn't. Professor Millwood introduces a new term, the Sinicate, analogous to terms such as Islamicate, Christendom, or Persian sphere that some world historians use. And he argues that other terms need to be used much more carefully, or perhaps not used at all. Terms such as unify or reunify, frontiers, borderlands, the particularly tricky Minzu and minority nationalities. In doing so, Professor Millwood wants to decolonize our narratives of Chinese history. The hope in doing so is that we are less likely to produce narratives that underwrite cruelty and violence. This is a hope I share, and I find the thrust of Professor Millwood's compelling a paper compelling and unobjectionable, but again, this is in part because his arguments have for so long now been part of my mental furniture. I want to think a little bit about historiography, and my argument is going to seem overstated, crudely drawn, and hyperbolic, necessarily under these circumstances. When I was reading the paper today, I was reminded of a remark that I had recently encountered by Sanjay Subramanian. In his essay, One for the Money, Two for the Show, Sanjay Subramanian considers the debate in South Asian historiography between the Subaltern Studies Group and the so-called Cambridge School. With his characteristic biting wit, Sanjay complains that it is as if we drinkers of Saint-Emilion and Le Lande de Pompero were constantly asked to declare our preferences between Coca-Cola and Pepsi. One of the problems with that debate, he thought, was its anglophone parochialism. Scholars working in other languages, such as French and German and Portuguese, were animated by entirely different questions, debates, and concerns. What can seem like a problem in the Anglophone scholarship can look very different, or not even appear to be a problem in the Francophone scholarship. In his paper, Professor Millwood juxtaposes what he calls the Fairbank School with the new and newer Qing history. But I wonder what happens when instead of taking John King Fairbank, and also Levinson and Skinner, uh, Fairbank and his acolytes, if instead of taking these as providing our problematic, we take the work of Paul Palio, Henri Masperou, Marcel Grané, Jacques Grené, Franz Grené, for example, or the Dutch tradition with such scholars as Jan de Hoop, Jan Dijvendak, Eric Zurch, and Baron Taha. How might this change our angle of attack in thinking about Chinese, the historiography of China? There are many fine historiographical surveys of the development of China studies in the United States, and most point to the importance of the Cold War in shaping area studies in this country, and relatedly, the preponderant focus on the political in Anglo-American studies of world areas. These areas, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, were grouped together as collections of nation states, China, Japan, and Korea, comprising East Asia, Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, perhaps a marginal case for Southeast Asia, 
India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and so on. These world areas have been defined in terms of, well, what modern nation states comprise, South Asia, Southeast Asia, or East Asia. Eventually, it became clear that there was some need to rescue history from the nation, it being everywhere. Uh, and in many ways, this has been admirably achieved by the new Qing history. We simply have a much more sophisticated understanding of interactions between Chinese people and what it meant to call oneself Chinese now because of Professor Millwood's pioneering work and that of those associated with the new Qing history. But the French and Dutch traditions in Chinese history, I think, have looked quite different from the Anglo-American ones. And to venture a very gross generalization, French and Dutch scholarship in China has placed considerably less emphasis on China understood politically and considerably more on China understood culturally. French language scholarship in particular has given enormous attention to the histories of Buddhism and Taoism and, and popular uh, religious culture. Reading that scholarship, one is struck by the continuous attention to Central and South Asia in the making of things we now call Chinese. The Turkic, Iranian, and Sanskrit legacies and what we think of as Chinese culture are everywhere and immediately evident. The spread of Taoist ritual practices emerges as one of the most important ways in which non-Han peoples in the South and Southwest became part of the syndicate world. And it seems to me then that there's a lot in the French and Dutch sinological traditions that we might read as previewing or even being continuous in some ways with the arguments of the new and newer Qing histories. Marshall Hodgson seemed to have faced a similar problem uh, as the one that is addressed in this paper in considering Islamic civilization and proposed two new terms, Islamdom and Islamic Kate. Islamdom following Christendom was a society in which the Muslims and their faith are recognized as prevalent and socially dominant. It is not an area as such, Hodgson writes, but a complex of social relations. And I think this is something key. Islamicate, he says, refers not to the religion Islam itself, but to the social and cultural complex historically associated with Islam and the Muslims, both among Muslims themselves and even when among non-Muslims. Professor Milbert proposes that we use the term syndicate in an by analogy. The syndicate indicates, he writes, the cultural continuity, shared historical memory, modes of legitimation, and the like that characterized many states in China without asserting political continuity or any kind of timeless metaphysical essence. In thinking about Chinese societies abroad, uh, he introduces the work of the scholar of comparative literature, Xu Xingmei, who proposes the term Sinophon to take into account uh, various forms of Chinese-ness outside of and not directly part of China. Although I do wonder about the potential use of a term such as Sinophon, uh, and particularly when we think about its how useful it might be for people who identify as Chinese without using the Chinese language whatsoever. What are we to do, for example, with somebody like Kui Tianjin, a journalist of Hokkien descent in Java in the beginning of the 20th century, who expressed all of his identity in the Malay language rather than anything uh, recognizably cynic? To the cynicate and to the sinophone, I want to suggest the cynic imaginary. The cynic imaginary recognizes that things we call Chinese are not united by the presence of any continuous metaphysical essence. It sees Chinese, this term at least, and others like it, rather as identifying what Wittgenstein called family resemblances. Wittgenstein takes the word game as his example. We call all kinds of things games, chess, solitaire, noughts and crosses, soccer, the Olympics, without there being a single thing they have in common, one defining feature, or even a set of defining features or traits. Soccer is more like rugby than it is chess or solitaire, but all are games of one kind or another. And so the cynic imaginary sees Chinese and its cognates similarly. The Hokkien Singaporean poet 
Leong Yu Kyok, who writes in English, the modern Vietnamese scholar Dao Ziyang, the god Guan Yu, the Sogdian and Guptok general An Lu Shan, and the Japanese reformer Fukuzawa Yukichi, all feature in this imaginary, all interacting with and taking part in different things we call Chinese. Sometimes this will be on the basis of using cynic scripts, sometimes on speaking a cynic language, sometimes because one is descended from someone who identified as Chinese. Sometimes it will be because cynic speaking people's violently established control over non-cynic speakers, and sometimes because non-cynic speakers established violent control over cynic speakers, the Manchu over uh, the Ming. One possible advantage, it seems to me, in terms of thinking using the notion of a cynic imaginary, is it focuses attention on, particularly on the points of articulation and interaction that establish these family resemblances and which make things what we call Chinese. This is a sketch, too much an outline, uh, about how I've been thinking uh, about things that we call Chinese, but particularly how they relate to things we now call Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, Singaporean, and Taiwanese, which all seem to me in various ways to articulate, to make a connection with something that we can call the cynic imaginary, the set of family resemblances uh, across time and space, rather than that of any single and persisting entity. And so I thank Professor Millwood uh, for prompting some of these reflections today and also for providing me now for more than 15 years uh, with profound uh, and ongoing insight about Central Asia, Xinjiang and the plight of the Uyghur people. Thank you. Well, Jim, I'm sure you um want to respond to a lot of that, but I'm wondering, I'm not sure how we proceed, but I'm wondering if we should actually open the floor to questions and comments. Yeah, go ahead, because people yeah. have been waiting very patiently for an hour, so yeah, let, yeah, right. let other questions come in. I'll we'll make sure notes. you have like the like last 10 minutes or 15 minutes, depending on how much time we have, um, to just respond to some of this. Um, so I'm going to open the floor. I'm, I'm not sure how we call on people. I'm going, uh, Guild, it, what, what did we do with the last group? Did they raise their hand on chat? Uh, we have two options. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we basically have two options. Either whoever wants the floor can unmute themselves and yeah, raise hand, or we can use the text uh, chat function and have people writing uh, their questions over chat. Right, okay, so let's, right now, Peter Carroll has raised his hand, so why don't we just go with that? We'll wing it, but we'll get all the questions out. So Peter, if you just unmute yourself, yeah. you'll have the floor. Yeah, so, so, so thanks so much for a really um, great talk and, and a really interesting um, paper. Um, my, one of my main responses, I think, is it, it's been stated by, by, by Melissa and Hayden in different ways, but I, I do, wonder how much some of these issues necessarily structure the way in which I think historians teach Chinese history or imperial history right now. I mean, I'm part, I'm, I'm thinking about this because I'm actually teaching um, Qing history right now. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, I, I think the paradigm has changed, but what your paper really underscored for me is I think how much many of these ideas Particularly, I think, I mean, what you said, it was really beautifully put in, in thinking of, you know, Tian Xia and how a worldview has been taken for a world order, how this really is central to much work in political science, particularly in international relations in ways which is very troubling. Uh, of course, much of it is applied to thinking about, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative and various other things. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you could maybe talk more about that. I mean, I, it is interesting that I think within history, at least the historians I know, you know, I think we do teach much in the way in which you, you know, are urging us to. But I think many other disciplines um, certainly still labor, you know, with these ideas, uh, which are problematic, you know, in mind. I was also curious, just two very quick things in terms of language. Um, in your paper, you do speak, um, you know, in, in a really suggestive way. And I think you end your 
footnote to yourself to, you know, say more, think about this more about the question of, of dynasty, you know, and Chao Dai. Um, and it is kind of significant, I think, as well that, I mean, the, um, the discussion of that, or rather the term from a Chinese dictionary, uh, which you use is Gai Chao Huan Dai. Right. I mean, again, it's kind of broken up. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you could maybe speak more about that or maybe we can just talk about that, you know, ourselves some other time. But that was really stimulating and interesting to me, as well as the question and, and the concerns that some of your Uyghur friends mentioned regarding the use of um, indigenous or indigene to refer you know, to Uyghur peoples. I mean, um, I was thinking maybe tomorrow I would ask you a question kind of about this. Uh, and, and the uses of, of history and historical narratives. Um, but I'm wondering, um, since this is a historical paper and you know, um, you know Manchu and, and various other languages, I mean, I'm wondering historically what, I mean, how did, let's say, the Qing, the Ising Joro House, refer to these people? And also maybe the ways in which they, in the past, and today have referred to themselves. I mean, just thinking of, of you know, different ways, which would be more appropriate, let's say, to um, you know, refer to different people. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Many other people have questions. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, the next on my list here is Lubna Al Amine um, in the political science department. And then after her, Chuck Hayford. Should we go now? Yes, please. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, actually, my question picks up very much on Melissa's point, which is the point about the modern state and how history is viewed. And um, I wonder, so one of the issues that's happening is that, you know, modern nationalists want to view history in a certain way. And the one continuity they very much emphasize is the continuity between China, um, Chinese history and the modern state. Like there's a big discontinuity there that potentially is different from the other discontinuities that you're emphasizing. So you're emphasizing that in all of Chinese histories, we shouldn't view it as continuous, totally fair point, but there's a particular one that happens um, and happens at a specific point that's different from Europe and Europe. So what I'm trying to say is that perhaps there is more continuity in Chinese history than say territorially than if you take Europe as a whole. It depends on how you, you're thinking about it. But what really is the problem is that then nationalists want to do is to say, look, and all of this means that as a state, we can do X, Y, and Z. And that's really where the problem comes that this history, continuous or not, is being used in a very different kind of political system, which is the modern state, that's very different from what any other political entity was before the creation of this entity, right? And so you're using it to make claims of a kind that they actually did not do um, beforehand. And so potentially the, the, the particular problem, and I think that's very much, that, that picks up on what Melissa was saying, that the particular problem is using history to shore up claims to sovereignty in a way that they actually were not potentially being used um, in Chinese history, even if it was more continuous, even if it was uniform, even if it was, or whether or not it was, that's not really the issue. Great, um, Chuck? Yeah, if, if I can just make a, um, a side point, uh, building partly on Peter's uh, observation that uh, people take these uh, uh, terms and use them for their own purposes. Um, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with this idea of a Fairbank school, uh, as if Fairbank is sitting in the classroom, you know, uh, knocking uh, knuckles uh, of, of students sitting at their desks um, and enforcing some sort of a, um, a paradigm. And uh, I, I, I was there, in, uh, I was a student of, of Fairbanks uh, in, the, in the 60s. And uh, there were a whole bunch of people around saying different things. Joe Fletcher um, um, was there, Alec Woodside, um, and um, it strikes me that uh, it's easy now to talk about uh, a Fairbank school, uh, uh, as you say, and, and, and you qualify it to be sure, uh, as simply a, a convenient representation um, in the same way that we used to talk about uh, Confucianism, uh, that when you had to explain something in quote unquote uh, traditional China, well, they did it because they were Confucian. Um, and I think what um, I would take from Peter's point um, is that uh, 
uh, we uh, shouldn't uh, uh, blame um, uh, uh, some composite of uh, Fairbank School uh, for uh, the way that people um, would put arguments together if Fairbank hadn't been there. Uh, so I wonder if there's some way of uh, stating what uh, I, I entirely agree with uh, the, uh, the thrust of the paper um, with, without using that uh, construct of, of Fairbank School, which, which I think gets into more trouble than, it, than it's worth. Okay, is there anyone else out there with a question? I don't have any hands up. Okay, going, going, gone. Okay, so uh, Jim, um, you know, you have a lot to chew on here, so. Well, we did, I, and we didn't even give you a free dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you have to hope you, next time maybe. Um, Okay, so first of all, thank you, Melissa, for those comments, and also for you know, particularly for pulling out uh, Liang Ti Chao and Li Chang Fu. I'm, is this from your current work? I'm wondering. Some, some um, of it yeah, yeah, yeah. The Southeast Asian dimension. Obviously, you know, I I'm up in the Northwest, and I miss so much of this stuff. But the more I think about Southeast Asia and, and maritime dimensions, the, the more interesting par parallels and resonances and then other things and, you know, um, so I, you know, I'll, I'll have to do some more, some more, some more reading on that. Um, certainly the issue here is national, is, is modern, even 20th century nationalistic uses um, of, um, attempts to create a national narrative out of the traditional Chinese historiographical approaches. And um, I, I taught a course on um, called ethnicity, empire, and identity uh, in China, where we uh, read secondary and some sort of primary stuff, um, you know, sort of about this and around these issues. And, and just kind of scratching the surface, actually, but um, our guides to these discussions, um, we read actually James Labeled kind of goes through, I don't know, it's not a well-known book, but um, uh, how China's, I think it was called, it, um, how peripheral peoples became Chinese or something like that. It, you know, it has a political kind of name, but it's actually a really good walk through these ideological discussions. And then actually, you know, both, both Wang Hui and Ge Zhao Guang do that too in, um, in their books, that, those that, that have been translated. Um, and, and one thing that is remarkable from this is to uh, what, a, what a broad and um, animated and important discussion this was in the early 20th century. You know, who is Chinese? Um, how do we define Chinese? You know, are these the five peoples of China, you know, Manchus, Mongols, Tibetans, Muslims, and Han? How are they related? How are these other people related? You know, uh, this was a central issue at times when you know people were worrying about what to eat and getting bombed by the Japanese and, and other things. So um, it's an ongoing conversation, and what we're seeing now and, uh, is really a continuation of that. So that's um, one thing. Now, um, the idea of the Dao Tong of this you know, of, of the use of um, of, of reading in, of writing in a succession of states into a legitimate, uh, you know, genealogy, as I call it, um, you know, that is central and really important, as I as I, as I, as I, as I point out. And you know, I don't want to throw that baby out with this with this bathwater. Um, I think we have to see it for what it is. Um, and I guess you know, in terms of um, how might this change the way any of us teach Chinese history. Uh, First of all, I have to, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I will admit this. I haven't taught a Chinese survey since 1996. You know, my job, I don't teach the survey. So, you know, I'm uh, not living in a glass house, whatever. I, I, it's easy for me to, to, set, to talk, right? Because I don't have to do this. Um, but um, uh, I think, you know, I think there's a, 
is an opportunity. I think our students would totally get it um, if we say, okay, there's this list of dynasties, but look, here's these other kinds of people too. I think we can make this much more of a feature in our courses uh, than we do. And, um, and then, then in that conversation, the, the, the stream of, um, of Confucianism that is inclusive, uh, and that is actually anti-racist in the sense that, uh, you know, that the culture in and of itself allows for this le legitimate civilization. Is the roaring too loud? Can you all hear me still? I don't know what I can do about it if it is, but I can close windows. Yeah. We, we can hear you, um, okay. but it, that's background noise. Okay, the, as long as that's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. getting loud. Um, and there's also smells of hot tar wafting in from the street. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, let's see. All right, let me, I'll just sort of leave that there. Yeah, and I, you know, I have a sentence in there about the dynastic concept being wielded as an ideological weapon. That may be a bit overstated, perhaps, but I don't mean... You know, I mean very much by contemporary regime, and as anyone can tell reading it, you know, there's a lot of uh, anger and, and, and you know, political feeling that's animating, uh, that's animating this right now. Um, and so maybe I'll tone some of this back. Um, the, as for reigning para paradigms, the Skinnerian, you know, rather than you know, fair banking, absolutely. I think you know, academic, again, it's, it's kind of, a cheap shot to say, well, we specialists, we get it all right. It's the, it's, it's the popularizers who are screwing it all up all the time. And that is kind of what I'm saying. Um, and so that's sort of unfair. But, um, but definitely, you know, these nuances are all there. I'm not making any of this up. It's, you know, as, as everyone has said, it's there in the, in the, in the field, I guess. But um, it's still not, we haven't figured out how to project that in such a way um, that you know, the journalists and that the textbook writers, or at least, you know, particularly, I mean, I haven't begun, I don't want this to turn into a textbook project where I kind of go through, you know, high school, will just, oh my God, you know, I get all the, I shudder to think what would be in those. Uh, all those, I don't know, some of them are actually pretty good, never mind, but I, I don't want to do that. Uh, still, we have to think of, there's an opportunity here to present, I think, the you know, China as a polylith. And perhaps all of this could be phrased more positively than I phrased it here rather than accusatorially. Um, um, and that's ultimately my, my, my project is to tell you know, Xi Jinping and his others, you know, you guys have got, you're conveying the wrong message here. You don't want a homogeneous Chinese identity. Um, you know, that's actually not going to win you favor in the world, it's not going to help your global soft power project, quite the opposite. Um, so you know, these two things are very much engaged in my mind. Okay. Um, so I think your, your first devil's advocate question, I, I have answered yes. I mean, there's, there, there is a, um, a challenge to China's legitimacy in Xinjiang. And maybe I held my tongue. Um, pulled my punches for previous decades, and now with what's going on there, I'm not doing that. Um, another way of putting it, though, is that you know, the legitimization, legitimacy of, of, of governance is not based on these historical matters. Um, it's, it's, it's based on, on governance. It's based on what you're doing, or at least on what you're not doing, that is not putting people in concentration camps. And so, yes, PRC policy right now is, is illegitimate, um, and, and I'm happy to say that. Um, all right, why should, and then why should, why should PRC, why should people in China you know, listen to me? Um, this is a very common thing that I you know, get when I read responses on Twitter or whatever. It's like, oh, well, what about, it's, it's, it's what about ism, you know, what about black lives in America? What about Native Americans and so on and so forth? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I'm actually thinking about a project which would write a it, it'd be kind of focused on, you know, I guess, you know, the idea of diversity um, or, or colonialism um, and, and in, a, in a summarized kind of historical essay manner, um, write U.S. and Chinese history of the last two, three hundred years side by side and interwoven. Um, because as, as many people pointed out, 
the, 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 you know, the re-education or educational transformation project that's going on in the camps in China right now, you know, it happened in, um, in mission schools in the United States. It happened in Australia and Canada. You know, th these have been pointed out. Um, there's a new book, some of you may um, know, um, well, Jeffrey Ostler, an American historian, um, who's talking about you know, Native Americans in the United, or Native nations in the United States, and the title is Surviving Genocide. And I think from what I get from this New York Review of Books review, um, you know, if, I would, if I would go back and look again in American history uh, of the West, for example, now, like I did in the 90s when I wrote about sort of frontier studies, I think we'd see much more open discussion of settler colonialism, what, you know, high, more carefully theorized and, and um, you know, even stripping away even more of the um, self-congratulatory gloss on the U.S. project. And, and I'm completely, so this is what I tell people, say, you know, what about the U.S.? I don't speak for the U.S., or I try not to, um, particularly now. <laughs> so um, that's, you know, and this is something which any foreign scholar in deal with China has noticed, and I'm sure with other places as well, you know, you're seen as representing your nation when you do this, um, and we have to be careful not to do that. All right, let's see. Um, thank you very much, um, Hayden, for this idea of the, of the cynic imaginary. Um, and, and you're really nicely, you know, articulated comments about that. Um, I realize I should go back to, you know, read Marshall Hodgson and how he actually discussed the idea of the Islamic. I'm using it, you know, it's kind of in the general sense that I picked up years ago, but I haven't looked closely at it again. So before I analogize to that idea, I should, I should catch up with that. Um, yeah, and obviously the, I'm being quite Anglo, Anglophonocentric, Anglocentric, Anglo-America centric myself here. Um, and, and I'll try not to leave the implication that that's the only Western or the only non-Chinese scholarship about China out there. Um, but what you're saying about both the Dutch and the French approaches and the cultural approach and also the recognition of Turkic or Southeast Asian or you know, the other close involvement and um, contributions to Chinese, Chinese you know, what we, the cynic imaginary. Um, I mean, this is very much what I try to do in working on the Silk Road and certainly in teaching about the Silk Road and, you know, um, and, 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 you know, why, for example, I'm concerned when the list of dynasties skips over that period from the third century, the Han, through the sixth century. That's a big time when China, you know, this is when Buddhism came in. This is when lots of people, my little article on Mulan you know, points this out. So um, that's exactly what I'm getting at, frankly. So I will look at these again and think about it. Um, yeah, and then syndicate, there, there's a danger of me kind of replicating a kind of cultural imperialism under a new term, particularly the way I said offhandedly included Vietnam and Korea and Japan, you know, in my new syndicate, um, you know, we have to be very careful not to, uh, you know, turn this into another form of um, Sino totalism or whatever, you know, like that. Um, all right, there's a lot, I have notes and we can talk some more. Hopefully I might, I might write you back about Wittgenstein. Um, so Peter, Peter Carroll's question, um, I think I actually sort of addressed it a little. I wanted to say to you, Peter, just my, my mea culpa that I'm not really teaching, you know, this myself. Uh, I certainly don't, and, 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 I'm, and I'm limited in that. Um, you know, I'm not in the classrooms of everyone who's teaching Chinese history. And so I don't mean to say that actually the way we're teaching it, and I have to be, go back and double ch be careful not to imply that everyone's teaching it wrong. That's not what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's at this kind of public level. Um, uh, the idea of, of, of Chao Dutch, so the Chinese terms, and this is a, you know, kind of sinological question. Um, what do all these terms mean? Um, I, yeah, I, I need to do more to do more work on that. Um, I mean, I will say, you know, the chow is the, the chow means a court, and it also means mourning, 
And so there's a sense of facing the court. It's a term that's used in the, um, the visit to the court, which sometimes gets translated you know, as a tributary mission. Um, so again, there's an interesting set of, of ideas in the Chinese self-description. You know, what is not there, and what I think is, is leaking in from the use of dynasty, um, uh, is this sense of a, of a family line, is, is the blurring of family line and state itself. Um, because, you know, in Chinese, you do say, you know, whatever the name of the state, so Qin or Ming, Ming Chao, you know, Qing Chao, right? That is how a term is, is, is state is referred to. Um, but those are distinct entities. Um, and, you know, the, the, the big question, and some people have worked on this, I think actually Mark Elliott has, has done a little on this, you know, that the terms by which China, how, what is the equivalent term for, you know, China as a generic term that includes all of those, um, those chow dai, right? And in a sense, that term is there, there are lots of terms that can mean Chinese culturally and other things and, you know, the, you know, the, the central states and, and, and so on. Um, in a sense there, it's there by implication, so you don't need to say it. Just like in, you know, in Chinese food, when you, in China, when you go out to eat Chinese food, no one says it's Chinese food, right? It's food. <laughs> so this is a, the state, politics, you know, it is. And, and so I think that is, um, is part of it. Um, but interestingly, I was, I was just reading um, a little bit of the, the Buddhist monk Shenzong, who, who traveled to India uh, in, the, in the seventh century. And he has an interesting dialogue with the monks in Nalanda um, about contrasting India and, and China. And then you know, he's going to go back to, to the Tang. And they say, don't go. Why go there? The Buddha wasn't born there. It's a barbaric place. And then he has this whole defense of, of, the, of the Tang in China in Confucian terms, actually. But the term they're using for where he, he's going to is, is jirna. Um, and this is, this is transcribed in Chinese by uh, by Xuanzang's fellow monk, who's, who's his biographer. But the, the word is, so the, the term which the Indian monks are using for China, he at least is transcribed as jirna. This is, it's the word China. Um, it's also the word that the Hong Kong, you know, the democratic elected council members used when they were signed in recently and got themselves disqualified as a result. It was used by the Japanese to refer to the territory of China in a way that is now seen as derogatory and even imperialistic. Um, but, you know, in the Tang period, it was how others referred to it. And, and, and so, um, you know, there's an argument that made that this, this collective term for China through time um, has always been used by outsiders looking at China and not by Chinese states themselves, when, because they didn't need to. You know, Shenzhong is a, is a monk of the Tang, but I'm not expert enough on that. Okay. Um, I, I, I'll just agree with Professor El Amine um, you know, about your comments on nationalism. Um, and that, you know, there have been, you know, new, new claims of sovereignty or different types of claims have been made, um, you know, more, more, more recently. Um, it, it, there is this sort of question is, you know, the, the, the tributary system critique gets us to um, what were pre-nationalist notions of sovereignty in East Asia, right? And, and when the international relations scholars want to look and find a different model, you know, an Asian model of international relations, um, you know, in one sense, this is good, right? Because they're not just going, they're not just assuming Thucydides applies everywhere. They're thinking, all right, maybe there is something different. Let's not be Eurocentric about it. So they're trying to not be Eurocentric. The problem is they're mis mis mistaking a schema, a simplified version of the schema for, you know, the, the world view, view for the, the world order. Um, uh, but there is a and 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 point and Chuck's point about me not always dumping on the Fairbanks school. Um, fair enough, and you know I 
um, did that 20 years ago and I got yelled at exactly the same way then and I still haven't learned. Um, but you're right, there's no reason to pick on it certainly now and I can rephrase that. Um, there is, however, the, the problem is Fairbank was just, you know, so central to this and that book, The Chinese World Order is the one that everyone turns to, um, you know, including the journalists and the you know, older political scientists and the policy makers of a certain generation, you know, all of them were trained up if they know anything about you know, China and East Asia at all, they were trained up with the, these textbooks and with this approach, right? And so that's one of the reasons I think why it's still very much with us. Um, but there is a new book, I, I, I think it's in my notes, but I wanna put a plug in, um, Timothy Brook um, and a bunch of Dutch scholars, speaking of the Dutch school. Um, sorry, I don't have it handy or I'd wave it around, but um, it's called Sacred Mandates. And, and my apologies to the Dutch scholars whose names I don't remember. That's not, it's very unfair. But Timothy Book and others, um, actually, and there's many people in there, um, but it, it really is the replacement for the Chinese world order. And, and they're suggesting, they're talking about three different legitimation systems, a Tibetan Buddhist one, uh, a Sinic one, and a Mongol one. So it's kind of similar to the New Qing history, um, but I think it does have some of that European approach from you know, uh, Mongolist and kind of the old Sinologic or, or Orientalist in the best sense scholarship um, animating it and, and, and underneath it. So I encourage people to look at that. Um, I think with my mea culpa about dumping on the Fairbank School, I think I've, I've addressed Chuck's question. So um, I think I'm done with answering at least the notes that I took down. I, I know I've missed a lot of your points. Um, for which I, I apologize. You know, um, Jim, I'm beginning to think that's not a construction site out your window. I think it's the Chinese embassy trying to distract you with all sorts of noise and tar and whatever. He's in DC, of course. Um, well, yeah, that was, kind of, I, that was, it's always kind of hard to deal with 20 questions at once. Um, but no, that was fine, especially since there was so much noise going on on your end. Um, but the great thing about this, the way we designed your visit, quote unquote, to Northwestern is that we, we meet again tomorrow, we focus more on what's going on in Xinjiang, what's driving um, your uh, moral sensibility, which I think is grounded <laughs> in something that's really quite awful going on in, over in China. Um, so we will continue this conversation tomorrow. Um, the, the way you all are here, so you obviously know how to link up, it's the same process for tomorrow. Um, and um, so I really want to thank you uh, for getting us started on this and talking about a very important subject. It's, it's true. Um, we, we as Chinese historians need to pay a lot more attention to the way we kind of buttress the centralizing impulses of the modern Chinese state, um, even if, you know, we don't want to balkanize it um, necessarily, not all of us at least. But anyway, this will be continued tomorrow. I forget the title of your talk tomorrow. What is the title of your talk tomorrow? It has Xinjiang in it, I think. Uh, Xinjiang. I remember exactly the crisis in Xinjiang, usually my titles, that's what are, those, those words are ubiquitous, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I kind of politely overlooked the polylith title. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't make it direct, directed, although it's a good I'm word. Saying, right, so it's in the chat. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone, for giving me a chance to test run, you know, really very raw stuff. Um, I, I gained a lot from just talking about it and, and really from your, from your comments. I've got a lot of work to do, but um, this was fun. No, it's very, um, it's very thought-provoking. Thanks very much. So. All right. So, thank you. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs>